In this video, I will be discussing how the physics derivation graph fits into a process of formalizing mathematical physics. So the discussion is going to start outside the scope of the physics derivation graph. Then I'm going to talk about the physics derivation graph itself. And then I'm going to end outside the scope of the project. So I'm going to make clear the, the boundaries of when I'm talking about the physics derivation graph and I'm not. Um, and the point of why I'm doing that is to provide some context for what the role I see for the physics derivation graph in the process of formalizing science. All right, so basically the outline is we're going to step through a sort of progression of different ways in which knowledge is captured. So this is on the, we're going to go through these steps and they're all available on the derivationmap.net slash roadmap. So where we're going to start first is on the lecture video. This is basically just um, standard delivery that you might see in a classroom or maybe between two researchers talking about physics. And they're on a whiteboard and it's a verbal description. So I'm not going to play the whole video, but just to give you an idea, um, you know, someone walks up to a whiteboard, they grab a pen, and they start talking about the problem that they're interested in. By some, by some combination of uh, drawings and uh, equations and a verbal overview. And I'm gonna... All right, so after that person uh, conveys what they're describing, then the next step might be that the, the audience might write down some, some notes, right? And so this might be a student writing down or maybe a, a researcher capturing the discussion. But basically there's, again, sort of what you saw on the whiteboard and it usually lacks or it has some of the comments from the verbal overview, but it's not a word for word conversation. The next step, usually if, if, it's, if it's worth the investment, someone might take those handwritten notes and add in um, sort of a LaTeX description of the expressions, as well as maybe a picture, and typically some more description of what the content was. Although again, not exactly what was uh, described in the verbal conversation, but enough that someone reading the document might be able to reconstruct the conversation. It's slightly more formal than what you'd find conversationally, and there are uh, some gaps that were maybe were covered verbally that are not captured in the, in the document. The things we're adding in here typically are um, prettier sort of expressions, and we've got these a expression numbering system that we can reference in the document, so that's kind of a feature that you didn't previously see in the handwritten or lecture notes. All right, so now we're going to move into uh, some what I call content tagging. So the content tagging, really there's different um, scopes of tagging. So the first might be just sort of taking that original LaTeX document and identifying sections of content. So this is uh, the first of three where you're just sort of outlining that, you know, what sort of concept, what, what is the purpose of this statement here? What is the purpose of this follow-on statement? And so you can sort of describe why all these different uh, pieces exist in this set of notes. So independent from that, you could also go about tagging all of the sentence uh, words uh, and then playing each role here of why is this word relevant to the rest of this context, right? And sort of the uh, the specific problem has a bunch of features, and these features are all sort of referenced within sentences. And so that's another thing that you could sort of tag in your document structure. And then lastly, um, another thing that you might want to do is focus on the mathematical part and say, like, this LaTeX expression could actually be represented more um, explicitly using something like a content math ML uh, method for saying like what all the different pieces within that LaTeX are. Um, so uh, this gets pretty verbose. So it's pretty unreadable already from the sort of human standpoint, but so was the other tagging. So this is sort of of the same ilk as far as tagging different pieces of an expression, making it more computer readable, but slightly less readable for a human. So that's sort of like the, the trade-off for tagging. All right, so all of that 
um, could be combined, the sentence and the word and the expression tagging into one, you know, very well uh, tagged document, but it becomes quite unreadable for any human editor. Usually the tags aren't presented explicitly, so it isn't an issue, but if you were to sort of manually tag all this content with these different features, uh, it would be uh, a lot of metadata that gets in the way of actually conveying the point of the document. All right, so that's sort of what you could do. Um, and then the, th that's in content tagging. And then one more thing that we'll do before getting into the physics derivation graph is identify the fact that there are symbols and there are words in these sentences and that they're related. So this, the word distance here and the symbol R, they're referring to the same thing. Similarly, um, further on in the document, we have the word work and the symbol W, those are related. So there's gonna be some way that you want to tie these words, concepts, and symbols together um, throughout the document. And that'll become more relevant later on. Now, the reason you might wanna do all this uh, tagging is to make the document searchable. Um, and so that's one sort of clear reason why you'd invest the work to do that. So now I'm gonna step back from the content tagging and transition to a, a different aspect. We're gonna talk about the fact that sometimes, uh, both in verbal presentation and in uh, notes, whether in a textbook or uh, some other way of capturing the derivation, there are some steps that are implicit. Um, so here, even though we had taken all the notes from the transcript of the video, there are some steps that were not explicitly stated. And so here in red, I've highlighted the additions to the document that make it clearer what all the steps are. So for instance, here, originally when we had this integral, we didn't step through all the um, pieces of the integral that we needed to make explicit. We just jumped to this conclusion. Um, so there's sort of an expectation that the reader will be able to do these operations but it's useful potentially to call out what exactly all the steps are. Okay, so that's now we're into the physics derivation graph in terms of making a document much more explicit about what it is that we're doing. So I'm gonna call up here uh, the derivation graph um, and this page takes a little while to load because it's actually analyzing the entire data structure of that um, explicit set of steps and we'll scroll down here in the page. So the physics derivation graph um, presents to you this thing that looks not at all like a, a LaTeX document or any of the notes that we've previously been looking at. And the reason for that is because it's making explicit connections between all the mathematical steps and the ways in which you get between steps. So we're having to make these inference rules um, and each inference rule is sort of like an explicit declaration of what it is that we're doing to this mathematical operation. And so that, yeah, and basically each page is presenting three ways of looking at it. One is like a table structure. That's what we're looking at here. And then that table structure corresponds to this graph viz static layout of the derivation, all the steps that are related. And you can see here importantly that it's not very linear. It's, there's a sequence of steps but they're not um, uh, just one after the other. There's uh, a more complicated structure there that the graph physics derivation graph captures. Okay, so if that's our derivation graph, um, that might be useful to just sort of recognize the fact that things aren't always as linear as you'd like, but we can do more with that. So again, staking, staying within the physics derivation graph, we're gonna do um, another sort of change and the change is we're going to take our original LaTeX expressions here and you want to replace them with their uh, SymPy uh, very the SymPy implementation of that same LaTeX expression. So that's what we did um, to get all those uh, steps but we're also going to replace each of the symbols with a unique numeric identifier and this is unique to that symbol, but consistent across all derivations. So wherever I see radius r, I'm gonna have the same 
mathematical sort of unique identifier associated with that. Uh, let's say it should be this one. So that uh, unique numeric ID is associated with this variable. And we do that for all the different uh, expressions in our derivation, and it's going to be consistent across all derivations. So again, that's not quite tagging, it's just sort of like replacing all the LaTeX with uh, SymPy and then replacing the variables in the SymPy with the unique numeric ID. Now why you might want to you know, do that extra work of getting it into a computer algebra system representation is that you can actually check the, the correctness of the steps. So where before we had just LaTeX expressions, by switching those out into SymPy, you could actually say, I want to make this change of variable and the computer algebra system can be used to validate that what you've claimed to have done was actually carried out. So we can do that for various steps. Um, here we're multiplying both sides of this expression by 2 over m1 and the result that we get back as validated by this computer algebra system says yes you did that correctly. So that's the value of converting it into a computer algebra system. The next step that I'll show, also within the physics derivation graph, is to validate the dimension of the variables. Now that's something that you could not have done without using the unique numeric identifiers for each variable. So because we've switched out the, new, the, the, the string symbols and we've replaced them with a unique numeric identifier that we can associate with a given dimension, we can use the computer algebra system to validate that each of these expressions is dimensionally consistent. All right, and lastly, so now we've, we've covered a lot of the topics within the physics derivation graph. We're going to leave the physics derivation graph and talk about how that relates potentially to a, uh, to a proof of system like Koch or Isabel or Lean. So I mentioned these uh, ex uh, inference rules previously, and the relation between the physics derivation graph and an inference rule is that the validity of an inference rule could be tied back to a logical set of axioms uh, that allow you to say whether or not that uh, inference rule is consistent. So that is now outside the scope of the physics derivation graph, but it relates uh, the full stack from the uh, context, content tags uh, down into the physics derivation graph where we use computer algebra systems and we do a unique uh, numeric ID, ID for the symbols and then we can tie that to the, the, the proof assistance uh, through the inference rules.